one of the things that's important in discussions about science and religion, the science constantly changes. And there are some, some people who sort of work on the assumption that, you know, that the scientific theories are kind of gradually approximating truth more closely. And it's, it's just this aggregation and accumulation of knowledge that's getting us closer and closer and closer to, to the truth. But if you look at the history of science, what you see, you don't actually see that. What you see are, are often great revolutions where all of what was known before is cast into doubt in light of a whole new theory, which gives people a whole set, new set of problems and, a, and new forms of knowledge. And one of the things I say to people who are really concerned about apparent conflicts between science and religion, these conflicts are, from the long historical perspective, these, these conflicts are, are, are things of the moment, you know, and, and people either resolve them or things on one side or the other change. But if you take the long historical view about science, one of the, one of the things you can say about it is that what is scientific orthodoxy today will almost certainly not be scientific orthodoxy tomorrow. And what's happening tomorrow is not just a fine-tuned version of what's happening today. Often it's really quite radically different and the, the realities that they believe exist are, are, are different. So you know, just to give you a specific example, when the shift from a Newtonian understanding of physics yeah. to an Einsteinian understanding yeah. of physics, we get a better purchase, you know, we, we get a better purchase on reality. That's the, that's the progress. So Einstein's view enables us to do things we couldn't do before, make predictions we couldn't make before. That's progress and that's improvement. But the realities that Einstein's theory posits are completely inconsistent with the realities that Newton posits. Newton talks about gravity as a force. Einstein talks about the way in which space-time is warped by, by mass. And so that these are completely incompatible and Einstein is not fine-tuning Newton's, as we call them, ontological categories, Newton's understanding of reality. He's throwing them out and giving us a whole new set. So there is a kind of progress because I think, as I've said, Einstein enables us to make, make predictions and, and descriptions that we couldn't make before and that Newton didn't enable us to do. But he does so by throwing out everything Newton posited as real and in, in instantiating his own set. Of, of reality. So to go, you know, what we're, we're trying to talk around this topic of what characterizes science. And one, I think, quite interesting thing is um, how it's constantly changing. And what that suggests is that to some extent, we've got a set of methods and a rough set of uh, rules that we use, but there's no consistent body of knowledge behind that. It's a classic statement of a very famous historian and philosopher of science called Thomas Kuhn who spoke about revolutionary science, he called it a normal science. And, and, and revolutionary science is these periods of great, as you said, paradigm changes from, from a Ptolemaic view to a Copernican view, and then from the Newtonian world to an Einsteinian world, from a, a, a natural thought theology understanding of, of nature to a Darwinian, um, a Darwinian revolution. Um, and I, that's been a very influential understanding of science that for, for most of the time, we potter along in normal science where we work it within a paradigm and we do make, you know, we fine tune bits and pieces. And then eventually, because of anomalies within that, the whole thing collapses under the weight of its internal inconsistency and is replaced by um, an alternative, an alternative revolutionary model. So here, look, I'd, I'd sound a note of caution here about following the science, because I think that can be, that can be misconstrued. I think for the most part, we should follow the science, which is to say, what is the scientific consensus about a particular issue of, of, of fact? And notwithstanding everything I've said about science changing, you know, I still think a scientific consensus is some of the most sound knowledge that we've got. But, but it's not in itself enough. It's not in itself enough because you always have to attach values you always have to attach values to the, to, to, to the scientific claims. And I think that's the point you're making, which I absolutely agree with. And, and what it means is that a purely scientific picture of the world is, is always going to be partial and inadequate because in order to do anything with it, yeah. you've got to add particular sets of values about, well, what, do, what are the things that, that, that we value? 
Um, and, and, you know, to take a recent example with the, you know, the coronavirus is obviously a classic example. We've got a pretty good consensus about what the knowledge is, but there's a whole range of policy questions that hang on issues of value that the science cannot determine for us. So we follow the science, sure, but following the science is not enough. You've got to have something else that you add to that. And that's why you get, you know, different state premiers having different policies about things and people saying, well, you know, we, let's open up the country. It's worth a few lives if we, for economic benefits and so on. All of those extra things mean that it's not just a matter of following the science. We must follow the science, yes, but there's a whole lot more we also need to do. And those value propositions have got to come from somewhere and they're not coming from science itself. In Peter Singer's case, really interesting question, why should we restrict this notion of benefit and good just to human animals and not all animals because all animals are capable of feeling. So there's a, there's a really interesting logic there. But as you've said, it's, it actually entails the application of a, of a whole value system um, to, to a set of problems and, and, and that's what you need. I mean, the other example you used, um, you just mentioned briefly Sam Harris and for, for your listeners, there's a kind of group of, there's a group of individuals including Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and uh, Daniel Dennett and Christopher Hitchens who were, who were known as the new atheists. And these guys are real fans of the idea of both science and religion uh, as, as, as deeply in conflict. And one of the consequences of this is that poor old Sam Harris has attempted to actually derive a morality from science. And look, you know, every philosopher in the world is just tearing their hair out going, you know, this is just a dismal failure. And this guy just doesn't know enough about philosophy to be able to even know where he's going wrong. But, you know, this is a complete embarrassment. Science by itself is insufficient. And you can't actually derive a system of moral values from a set of putative facts about the natural world. It just doesn't work. Yeah. You know, my view about the, the, the standard model, it gives us fantastic predictability. Let's be clear about that. And that's why it's such a powerful model. But the realities it posits are really quite crazy. And, and what we know in physics is that we haven't been able to bring together, um, we haven't been able to, to unify the, the theories of physics in a way that makes any sense. And, you know, our ignorance in the sphere of physics, it's, it is quite explicit in the fact that we have the, the so-called dark matter and dark energy in the universe. Yeah. We don't know what most of the universe is made of. Uh, we don't know where a lot of the energy comes from. So what we're thinking is that further down the track, there's going to be some new theory that somehow manages to unify that and explain it. But that's just a specific case of, the general point about the limitations of, of our, even our present knowledge in the sciences and the fact that there are lots of things we don't know. Now, I want to be clear, I don't think that's a space that you put God in or that you put any kind of spiritual reality in, yeah. but it does counsel a certain kind yeah. of modesty that, that we need to be very modest in our understanding of what we think we, we know because we don't really know that much. And that applies not just to physics but really you know to the workings of our own minds you know we're, we're yeah. hardly scratching the surface there and so that the idea that science might rule out certain kinds of things I think is just deeply premature uh, and it's just a, a prejudice and we need to just keep open minds about what reality is ultimately like and what stuff might really be out there yeah. I, I think it's important to say this that that almost every every scientific theory that we now have starts as a heresy yeah. but not every heresy ends up being scientific orthodoxy today so there's lots of heretical exactly. views around yeah maybe one in a hundred gets to be the new scientific orthodoxy so in the scientific sphere i think we need to be clear not every heretical claim turns out to be true on the contrary most of them will probably turn out to be false but if we're going to have a healthy science it's like mutations in genetics. You, know, you need to have those heretical views um, you need in, in order to, to have the possibility for, for moving on and extrapolating from that. The same is true for our society. And this is, this is, a, this is a kind of standard point that John Stuart Mill made in the 19th century, that we have to have a range of heterodox views and be tolerant of them, even if we completely disagree with them because social progress is only possible 
when you have the possibility for tolerating a range of positions. So I think the, the point here is not to be anti-science. The point here is to be pro, pro tolerance and a pro a liberal approach because the sciences have mechanisms ultimately for determining the rightness or wrongness of things. But underpinning that, there tends to be people with prejudicial attitudes and it's those prejudicial prejudicial attitudes ultimately that are in the social context I think illiberal and unfortunate and in the scientific context also likely to stymie progress if if we don't allow people to develop heterodox views and let them and test them essentially test them but it's the testing that's important too yeah you can't you can't follow the science if you don't allow the process to occur